The following Zoom session is being recorded and will appear later today on my YouTube channel, Math with Mayo. There are two different classes that may be observing this session. Therefore, when you participate in the Zoom meeting, if you do not wish for your picture or your name to be made public, please leave the video off and use an alias name. If you have questions during the meeting but do not wish to speak, email me at email at ybcc.edu and I will respond as soon as I can. All right, first of all, I want to remind you or point out whatever that tomorrow, May 4th, is advising day. There will be no classes tomorrow, no office hour, no Zoom meetings. Zip, nada, zilch, okay? So tomorrow you should plan on meeting with your advisor to get ready for uh, summer quarter as well as fall quarter. So again, no class meetings tomorrow. All right, eventually we're gonna go on and finish part two of section 9.1 from yesterday, but I had a request to look at uh, interval notation and graphing and things, and so I wanna do a little bit of review of that idea. So first of all, let's say we have the following graph. Okay, and let's say it looks like this. It comes down here, it goes up there, and then it ends right there, okay? So let's talk about the domain. The domain consists of all the X values. So for instance, the smallest or least x value would be negative three. And moving along, the largest x value would be positive three. It includes negative three and positive three and everything in between it, all the x values in between it. So the domain would go from negative three inclusive to positive three, also inclusive. So we use a bracket to indicate that those endpoints are part of the interval, okay? Now, let's go back to the same graph and look at the range. The range, the lowest value would be zero and the highest value would be four. And again, it includes all the Y values in between. So the range would go from zero to four inclusive. Okay, now let's alter this graph just a little bit. Let's say that we change this point to where we make it an open circle, okay? Everything else remains the same. Now, when we start looking at X values, okay, oops, X values, it doesn't include negative three. So we would not include negative three in the domain. So we would use a parenthesis to say it starts right after negative three. It still includes everything after that up to positive three. So that wouldn't change. It also doesn't change our range because even though um, this particular point is no longer included, the y value for this point is one, but right over here, there is another point that has a y value of one. So the domain would change slightly, the range would not change, okay? Let's look at another example. And let's see here, how about this graph where we have a solid dot here and Let's see here, a solid dot there and an open circle there. And let's say it does this. But in fact, let's do this. Let's make it go on past there. All right, so now the domain. Well, if we look at the left end of the graph, as this arrow is going upwards, it's also going over. So it's gonna, it's gonna go continue to the left to negative infinity. Now, negative infinity isn't a specific endpoint, so we use parentheses there. 
if we used a bracket, that would imply that there is a specific value that's negative infinity. And it's more of a concept of the idea of you just keep going forever. However, on the right end of this graph, it stops at what? X equals positive three, and it doesn't include it. So that would also be open-ended, okay? Now let's take a look at the range of this graph. The range, well, the lowest range value is at negative one, but it doesn't include it. The highest range or y value is going to be positive infinity. So that's what that graph looks like. All righty. Um, let's take a look at some other situations. So let's say we've got, and this goes back to some things kind of like what were in the book. Let's say you've got what was in the book. You've got uh, g of x equals the square root of x plus 9. All right. And we're asked to find the domain. So because we're taking an even root, the index is an implied 2. So we're taking a square root, which is an even root. The radicand, the stuff inside of the radical, can't be negative because you can't take an even root of a negative number and get a real answer. So that means that x plus 9 has to either be positive, that is greater than 0, or equal to 0. So if we take that inequality and we solve it, for x, we get x is greater than or equal to negative 9. Now, how would we put that in interval notation? Where we're, well, we're including negative 9 and everything larger. Again, we never put brackets around negative or positive infinity. But this says everything, including negative 9, all the way up to infinity. OK? Let's take a look at one more example. H of x equals, we'll say, the square root of uh, 4 minus 2x. OK, so again, we're taking an even root. So 4 minus 2x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Solving this inequality, we'll subtract 4 from both sides. And we get negative 2x greater than or equal to negative 4. Then we'll divide both sides by negative 2. Recall that when you multiply or divide both sides of an inequality statement by a negative number, you change the direction of the inequality symbol. So now I've got x is less than or equal to 2. So that's going to go from negative infinity up to and including 2. All right. So again, if a number is included, it's a bracket. If it's not included, it's a parentheses. OK, let's go on and take a look at uh, some examples from where we're headed today. That is to wrap up section 9.1. So this is 9.1. Oops, ah, let's try that again. 9.1 part 2. OK, it says find each function value if possible. And it says f of x equals the square root of 3x plus 1. We are to find f of 8 and then f of negative 2. OK, f of 8. So we're going to get the square root of 3 times 8 plus 1, which is the square root of 24 plus 1 which is the square root of 25, which is 5. So f of 8 equals 5. f of negative 2 would be the square root of 3 times negative 2 plus 1, which is the square root of negative 6 plus 1, which is the square root of negative 5, which is not real. Now, the book is saying it's undefined. And I don't know that I agree with that. To me, undefined is when you're dividing by zero. We're not doing that. But it's certainly not a real answer. OK, let's take a look at another example. 
that says g of x equals the cube root of x minus four. We are to find g of 12 and g of negative 23. g of 12 would be the cube root of 12 minus four, which is the cube root of eight. Now we're taking the cube root, not the square root. So that would be two because two cubed is eight. So the cube root of eight is two. Okay, so g of 12 equals two. Let's see here, the cube root, excuse me, g of negative 23 would be the cube root of negative 23 minus four, which is the cube root of negative 27. We can take an odd root of a negative number. The cube root of negative 27 is negative three. So g of negative 23 is negative three. Any questions about those examples? All right, continuing on. Now we're gonna use a calculator. It says given f of x equals the square root of x squared plus one, we are to find f of four. So that would be the square root of four squared plus one, which is the square root of 16 plus one, which is the square root of 17. Now, on the calculator, I'm going to find the square root button. And on the TI 30 uh, Roman numeral 2 uh, or 30X Roman numeral 2S, it is the first column. So it's right here. And there is a button that says X squared. But the second function is a radical, a square root symbol. So I'm going to go second square root, and when I do that, this appears. I'll type in 17 and then close it up with a right hand parentheses, push equals, and I get 4.12310562626, etc., etc. The directions say to round to the nearest 10,000th. Let's see, this is the 10th, 100th, thousandth, 10,000th thousand place. Going one place further, the zero would round down. So my answer is going to be 4.1231. Okay. Let's do another one of those. Let's, using that same function, let's find f of 2.35. So that's going to be the square root of 2.35 squared plus 1, which is, let's see here, 2.35 squared is 5.5225, and then plus one would be the square root of 6.5225. And so let's see here, the square root, oops, the square root of 6.5225 equals, 2.5539185588. But again, going to the nearest 10,000th, the one would round down. So we're going to get uh, 2.5539 as our answer approximated to there is 10,000th. Okay. Any questions about that or about the keys on the calculator. All righty then. Uh, let's see here. Now we're going to look at the cube root of one. Well, one times one times one is one. So the cube root of one is one. Well, what about the cube root of eight? Two times two is four times two is eight. So the cube root of eight is two. What about the cube root of 125 over 64? We'll talk more about this in subsequent sections, but for right now, let's just say I can deal with this as a separate numerator and denominator, okay? What times itself times itself is 125? Well, five times five is 25 times 25 is 125. 
So the cube root of 125 is 5. 8 times 8 is 64, but that would be a square. 4 times 4 is 16, times 4 is 64. So the cube root of 64 is 4. So the cube root of 125 over 64 becomes 5 fourths. Okay. All right. Now, what about the cube root of negative 512 x cubed? Hmm. What times itself times itself is 512? Well, I just did 5 times 5 times 5 was 125. So I know it's bigger than 5. Let's see. 6 times 6 times 6, 216. 7 times 7 times 7 is 343. 8 times 8 times 8 is, oh, 512. But how would it get to be negative? By using negative 8. So the cube root of negative 512 is negative 8. And the cube root of x cubed is x. Hmm. Remember, we had all that discussion about absolute value bars. Do I need absolute value bars around x? No. Since I'm taking an odd root, it can give me a negative answer. So x could be negative. So I don't need absolute value bars there. All right. Now, suppose rather than using trial and error, I want to find the q root of negative 512. How do I go about doing that? Well, let's go back to the buttons on the calculator. So again, over on the left column, there is a button that says x squared. And the second function key above it is the square root symbol. Above that, there's a button that looks like a little carrot. And the second uh, function key of that is the x root, OK? So using this button, I can find the cube root or fourth root or fifth root or whatever. But the way I use this button is I type in the index first. So to get the cube root of negative 512, with my calculator cleared, I'm going to put in a 3, OK? Then I'm going to push second function. That is to say, I'm going to do the x root. OK, so now what I've got in my calculator looks like this. I'm going to put in negative 512. Now I'm not going to use the subtraction sign. Not going to use the subtraction sign. I'm going to use the negative sign, which is down there. I know that's kind of awkward. OK. And then equals, and I get negative 8. Now I've got to go back. I can't do the cube root of x cubed on my calculator, but the cube root of x cubed is going to be x, as we talked about before. OK, let's see here. How about this one? The cube root of negative 343, a to the sixth, b cubed. So the cube root of negative 343, again, I could use trial and error and go 5 times 5 times 5, 6 times 6 times 6, 7 times 7 times 7 if I wanted to. And if I did that, I'd find that 7 times 7 times 7 is 343. So it's going to be negative 7. And then the cube root of a to the 6 would be a squared. The cube root of b cubed would be b. But again, I could also go back and do cube root, x root, which then looks like this, put in negative 343 equals and get my negative 7 that way. Let's see here, 3, second, that, negative 343. So there gives me, that gives me my negative 7. And then, of course, the variables you have to do without the calculator. OK. Uh, we're going to do some more graphing. And to do that, I'm going to switch screens. I tested this screen just a little while ago, and it was working then. We'll see what happens. OK. So let's see here. It says complete each table and then graph the function, give the domain and range. So we have f of x equals the cube root of x minus 3. Okay, And they've already given us 
some specific table values. This is x and y, negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8. Now, we're not taking a square root, we're taking a cube root. Notice that the x values are all perfect cubes. Negative 8 is negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. Positive 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. Negative 1 is negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. 1 is 1 times 1 times 1. And 0 is 0 times 0 times 0. So to find f of negative 8, we would have the cube root of negative 8 minus 3, which is negative 2 minus 3 or negative 5. Note that the minus 3 is not inside the radical. It's a separate term. OK, so negative 8, negative 5. F of negative 1 is the cube root of negative 1 minus 3, which is negative 1 minus 3 or negative 4. F of 0 is the cube root of 0 minus 3, which is 0 minus 3 or negative 3. F of 1 is the cube root of 1 minus 3, which is 1 minus 3 or negative 2. And f of 8 is the cube root of 8 minus 3, which is 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. Notice we can take cube roots of negative numbers and we can get negative answers. It's with even roots that you have to be careful. You can't take an even root of a negative number and get a real answer. And when you take an even root, you can't get a negative answer. But with cube roots or other odd roots, there's not those restrictions. OK, let's go over here and put a scale on our graph. So negative 8, negative 5 would be here. Negative 1, negative 4 is there. 0, negative 3, 1, negative 2, and 8, negative 1. And so our graph is going to look like that, OK, more or less. Now, this arrow on here. This arrow going to the left is not only continuing to the left, but it's also going down. This arrow to the right is continuing to the right and going up. So our domain is going to be all real numbers. And the range is also going to be all real numbers. Any questions about that example? OK, let's take a look at another one. This says f of x equals the cube root of x minus 3. We are to graph the function, give the domain and the range. Well, let's do this, in fact. Let's go back and let's get rid of this for a moment. And let's say g of x equals um, the cube root of x, OK? g of x equals the cube root of x. We're going to come back to that f of x here in a minute. f of x equals the cube root of x minus 3. OK, so let's go back to the red one. Since I'm taking the cube root of x, it would be nice to take cube roots of cubes, like negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8, which would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, respectively, OK? Which is very much like what we did uh, here, OK? That first part of it. And then when we got done with that, we subtracted 3 from the results. OK, now the minus 3 is inside the radical. It would be nice if I was taking cube roots of cubes, OK? 
but inside I've got x minus three. So here's what I want to do. I want to get the same nice answers. Okay. But when I put an x value in, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to subtract three. Then I'm going to take the cube root. So if I take these numbers and I add three to them, so for instance, negative eight plus three, negative five, negative one plus three, two, zero plus three, three, one plus three, four, eight plus three, 11. If I put those numbers in, the first thing that happens is I subtract three, which now gives me those negative eight, negative one, zero, one, and eight values, and I'll get the outcomes that I want. Now, I don't have to do this. I can pick any real number I want, but then I might get some not nice numbers and have to approximate and graph it that way. Doing it this way, I get nice outputs. So the fact that I subtracted three inside the radical before I took the cube root by increasing the original x values by three, then when I take the three away, I still end up with nice numbers. Okay, negative five, negative two is right there. And let's see, uh, two, negative one is right there. Three, zero, four, one, and 11, two. Let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, two. Okay, so then my graph. Looks like that. It has similar characteristics to the previous graph. So my domain and my range is again gonna be all real numbers. Okay, now we're gonna look at some, uh, just taking some roots and it says to do this without a calculator. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my other screen. And let's see here. So, um, it says evaluate each radical expression if possible without using a calculator. The fourth root of 81. So, it's an even root, but fortunately, my radicand is a positive number. I can take an even root of a positive number. Okay, so we're going to do that. I'm looking for a number who, when, when raised to the fourth power, is 81. So the answer, that times that times that times itself, is 81. Well, 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 is 1, so it's got to be bigger than that. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. It's got to be bigger than that. 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is 81. Ah. Since 3 to the fourth power equals 81, the fourth root of 81 is 3. And I don't need the parentheses there. I was just putting that there to show that that's what goes below. Um, how about this? The sixth root of 64. So now we're looking for something where this times itself, times itself, times itself, times itself, times itself is 64. One times one times one times one times one times one is one. Two times two is four. Times two is eight. Times two is 16. Times two is 32. Aha, times two is 64. So the sixth root of 64 equals two. In fact, we could say the sixth root of two to the sixth equals two. Uh, let's see, how about this one? The sixth root of the square root of negative 729. Okay. Hmm. We're taking an even root. Hmm. We can't take an even root of a negative number, can we? So this is not real. 
Good thing I didn't waste time trying to figure out what the number was. And now let's deal with some uh, possible absolute value situations. Let's take a look here. Let's say we've got the fifth root of 32 a to the fifth power. Okay, we're taking an odd root, so there's no restrictions. So we don't have to worry about absolute values here. The absolute, or not, this is, excuse me, the, the fifth root of 32, two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32, so that would be two. And the fifth, the fifth root of a to the fifth would be a. And again, I don't need absolute value bars because we're taking an odd root, so a can be positive or negative. It, oh, the directions say assume all variables are unrestricted. Okay. Now, let's say I've got this situation, the eighth root of t to the eighth power. Again, assume all variables are unrestricted. Well, the eighth root of t to the eighth power would be t. However, since we don't know if t is positive or negative, and we're taking an even root, we need absolute value bars there. Okay, any questions about that one? All right, let's take a look at this one. The sixth root of 64 b to the sixth power. Well, 64 is two times two is four times two is eight times two is 16 times two is 32 times two is 64. So the sixth root of 64 is two. The sixth root of b to the sixth is b. However, since b could be positive or negative and we're taking an even root, we have to use absolute value bars around the b. What if we have this, the sixth root of 64 b to the 12th power? Well, the sixth root of 64 is still two. The sixth root of b to the 12th is b squared. b has no restrictions on it, but b squared couldn't be negative if it's real, which it is, so I don't need absolute value bars there. Okay, let's see here. How about this one? Negative the fifth root of one over negative 32. Now the negative sign outside of the radical gets attached later. Recall that a radical among other things is a grouping symbol. So we'll come back to dealing with that. Well, we can take this and we could rewrite it as negative, the fifth root of negative one over the fifth root of 32. I'm gonna put this negative sign, I'm gonna attach it to the numerator, okay? Now, the fifth root of negative one is negative one. Negative one times negative one times negative one times negative one times negative one. Five negatives multiplied is still negative. The fifth root of 32, two, four, eight, 16, 32. But now I've got minus a negative, which ultimately makes it a positive. So that becomes one over, oops. I messed up there. What did I do wrong? <laughs> I got too busy focusing on the wrong thing. It should be that, right? The fifth root of 32 is two, two in the denominator, but still subtracting a negative is a positive. So we get one over two. Sorry about that, must be Monday. Okay, let's take a look at some things that they call lookalikes. We've got the square root of 64, and then the cube root of 64, all right? Well, the square root of 64 would be eight, because eight times eight is 64. The cube root of 64 would be four, because four times four is 16, times four is 64. But what about these? The square root of negative 64, and the cube root of negative 64. Well, the square root of negative 64 is not real because you can't take an even root of a negative number. The cube root of negative 64 is real. It's negative four. Any questions there? All righty. Well, that's all I have for you today. 
So tonight, wrap up section 9.1, that is part two. A reminder, there is no class tomorrow. It's advising day. There'll be no class meetings, no office hour, no Zoom meetings, no contact in terms of this format tomorrow. We'll return on Wednesday. I do have an office hour this afternoon at 1.15. So if you have questions and want to come back then, that's fine. Anyway, anything, Austin, you want to add before we start to stop the recording? Okay, I'll take that no, as a no. I'm all good. <laughs> okay, great. Have a great rest of the day.